In this session, we'll look at another sedimentation problem. The problem is very similar to the homework problems okay. and will help to clarify some of the terms such as horizontal fluid velocity. A little bit at conceptualizing and then we'll do a sedimentation problem. And I also added a little bit on sludge production. Um, again, kind of trying to address some of the confusions, um, especially with the stoichiometry. Okay, so we have a situation here where we have a, a design flow at 0.2 meters cubed per second, so about 4 mgd, and the objective is turbidity removal. So alum is used as the coagulant, dose of 35 milligrams per liter. You're told to assume a water temperature of 10 degrees C, and you're asked to check the calculations for a colleague. So that flow is divided into four tanks. You're told that you're a chain and flight sludge collector. You're given the length, width, water depth of the tank, the sludge zone depth, the freeboard. You're told about the launders. So we've got the length. And the width. Notice here, it's essentially, it, it's two tanks adjacent to each other. Why construct the tanks in this way? What are the advantages? What are the advantages of, okay, one, we've got a lower, t increasing the number of tanks, actually increasing the number of tanks will increase the detention time okay, because of flow rate to each. But why? Why put two tanks right next to one another like this? I've got an influent piping. I've got to pipe that from the previous process. Piping costs money. Concrete costs money. <clears throat> so I can, all of these um, devices, we've got basically, a, we've got a flow divider here. So the flow can come in on a central pipe from the previous process, then be divided, and then divided, and then we have typically a baffle system for the inlet, okay, to try and reduce the amount of turbulence and to ensure that the flow is distributed across the entire tank. Length, width, um, the launder is labeled, you see the launder here, 20 meters. We have weirs on both sides. So we have flow from the tank, so that effluent is flowing from both sides of the launder or both sides of the tank into the launder. The freeboard shown here. So freeboard is just simply, if you kind of think about a swimming pool, you don't have the water level right up to the top of the swimming pool. You have some amount of space, okay, so that water isn't splashing out onto the deck. Same thing. We want to make sure that we have a certain amount of space so that water isn't flowing over the top of the tank onto the surrounding ground. The sludge zone is right here. The water depth is here. So when we're designing the sedimentation basin and we're determining the amount of removal, it's the water depth that's important. We, we're not going to use the sludge zone in our calculations. So, and that's a conservative <clears throat> approach. The whole tank depth includes the freeboard plus the water depth or the side water depth plus the sludge zone depth. The chain and flight is at the bottom. You can see it here. So you can see that mechanism and this is our chain here and it is pushing sludge into this hopper and then from that hopper the sludge is then pumped for further treatment, to dewatering, thickening, and then ultimate disposal. The next thing I'd like you to do in your breakout room 
is to determine the tank detention time, the overflow rate, and the weir loading rate. Detention time. Okay. Most of you <clears throat> got the the equation correct. Okay, so the concept. So the detention time is equal to the volume divided by the flow rate. Okay. And the volume is four meters times 60 meters. So the width and the length are straightforward. The depth, it's two meters. For the design, to cons we're conservative in the design. We, we're not using either the sludge zone nor the freeboard. Because remember, the free there's no water in the freeboard. We're not using either of those to calculate the volume. Also, remember, there's four tanks. So our flow rate is divided by four. So this is 0.2 meters cubed per second, 3,600 seconds per hour. And we have four tanks. So this is. 2.67 hours. Typically, with sedimentation, your detention time will be in hours. Now, one of the things to recognize, if you look up the GLUM standards, you find that the minimum detention time is four hours for water treatment, unless your overflow rate is less than 1.2 meters per hour, which corresponds to 28.8 .8 meters cubed per meter squared per day. So we need to determine whether or not we've met that criteria. Important in your design, mini design, you need to be thinking about these criteria and you need to make sure that you're meeting the criteria. So the overflow rate is equal to Q over the surface area. Here's our tank. Okay. So the surface area is the width times the length. Okay, so make sure conceptually, this is where um, common mistakes occur. Okay. And this is also equal to the height over the detention time. And the textbook will use T naught. So T naught and TD are identical. And that is just 0.2 meters cubed per second times 86,400 seconds per day divided by four, divided by the length times the width. And that is equal to 18 meters cubed per meter squared per day. Okay. So we've met the criteria. The weir loading rate is typically in meters cubed per length per day. And this needs to be less than 250 meters cubed per meter per day. Why? Because if it's too great, then turbulence is significant. The flow rate converted to meters cubed per day. Divide that by four again, because we have four tanks. We have 20 meters of launder. We have two launders per tank. And both sides have weirs. So we have two launders. Both sides have weirs. In some cases, that won't be the case. You don't need. You don't necessarily need to have weirs on both sides. Any questions?
Okay, so before we go on to the next part, we often need the <clears throat> cross sectional area. So the cross sectional area is the area across which water is flowing. So think about the plane into which water is flowing and the plane into which water is leaving the basin. So this is the plane here. So our cross-sectional area is equal to the height times the width. So think about that, okay? So we've got a surface area and a cross-sectional area. The next thing I'd like you to do is to calculate the average horizontal fluid velocity. And then what I'd like you to do is to determine the dry weight of sludge, assuming that the influence suspended solids concentration is 50 milligrams per liter and the removal efficiency is 90%. So if we think about that here, here's my tank. I have an influence suspended solids concentration of 50 milligrams per liter. What's leaving is 10% of that. Right? So I've removed 90%. That 90% is in my sludge. You're adding 35 milligrams per liter of alum, giving you the molecular weights. The average horizontal velocity is Q over the cross-sectional area. So as you've all noted, it is 0.2 meters per second divided by four for the four tanks, divided by two meters depth. Again, we're only using the water depth times the width. And that is equal to 0 0.00625 meters per second. And this needs to be in the range 0 0.05 to 0 0.018 meters per second. So one of the things to note when you're doing this in your design, it's actually really helpful to use solver. In solver, you can set the criteria and solver will help find an optimal. It'll also tell you if there isn't an optimal. So then you can start trying to think about how to adjust your flow rates, number of tanks, et cetera, okay? So the next part here, we need to be thinking about the equation where we have alum. So we're adding alum. I just used the equation without alkalinity, although we could have used the one with alkalinity. It would have given us the same results. To form aluminum hydroxide, Notice there's four, three waters of hydration. When you're calculating the molecular weight, you need to include those waters of hydration. Plus three moles of sulfuric acid plus two moles of water. Okay. We're adding 35 milligrams per liter of alum. We need to divide that by the molecular weight to obtain the concentration in moles per liter. We have a two to one stoichiometry. So two moles of aluminum hydroxide for every one mole of alum that we add. So that means we will produce 0.0118 millimoles per liter of aluminum hydroxide. To get the, that in milligrams per liter, we'll multiply by the molecular weight. Again, remember when you're calculating the molecular weight, include the waters of hydration. So this is 132 milligrams per millimole, and that is 15.6 milligrams per liter. We said that we had 50 
milligrams per liter of suspended solids. We're removing 90%. So that means in terms of mass balance, we have 45 milligrams per liter of suspended solids. So we can add, now that we have this in mass, we have 15.6 milligrams per liter of aluminum hydroxide, 45 milligrams per liter of suspended solids. We're going to calculate this for the entire flow. So it's 0.2 meters cubed per second times 86,400 seconds per day. We have 1,000 liters per meter cubed. So meters cubed cancel, liters cancel, and there are 10 to the 6 milligrams in every kilogram. So milligrams cancel, and we have 1,046 kilograms per day of dry sludge. So that is our dry mass of sludge. Any questions about that? The 45 is, so we have 50. We multiply by 0.1, because I said it's 90% removal. That's equal to five. So that's our five. Or if we take 50 times 0 0.9, which is the 90% we've removed, and that is 45. Good question. Part that I've asked you to do is to calculate the Reynolds number. So the rent, the hydraulic radius is your cross-sectional area divided by the wetted perimeter. So it's the depth times the width divided by just the wetted perimeter. Okay, we have two times our depth plus the width. And that is equal to 1.0. So the Reynolds number is equal, and this is the Reynolds number for fluid flow, is equal to the hydraulic, sorry, the horizontal flow velocity times the hydraulic radius divided by the viscosity. And that is, and that's the kinematic viscosity you want to use. So that's 0 0.00625 meters per second that we calculated previously, times the 1.0 meter that we just calculated, divided by 1.307 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second. Units all cancel. We end up with a dimensionless number. That's 4,782 which is less than 20,000. So that's acceptable. The Freund number, actually, let me ask you this. Why do we care about the Reynolds number to determine if the flow is turbulent? Exactly. We want to know whether it's laminar flow turbulent. Okay. You want a low Reynolds number. Okay. The Freund number is used to determine the backflow. Backwashing term, you'll see we'll use that extensively with filtration. We're talking about preventing backflow. And that is equal to the horizontal velocity squared divided by the gravitational acceleration times that hydraulic radius. Again, units cancel. And that is equal to 3.98 times 10 to the minus 6. We want this to be greater than 10 to the minus 5. The answer is no, we don't. We're close. On your designs, do the best you can. It is extremely difficult to meet every one of these criteria. Make sure you meet the GLUM standards. Those will take priority over everything. Do the best you can to minimize your Reynolds number and maximize the Freund number. But it will be challenging. And solver will, if you can use solver, solver will make it a lot easier in terms of doing these calculations.